Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience and holding. We now have our presenters in conference. Please be aware, each of your lines is in a listen-only mode. You may submit your questions electronically anytime at the Q&A pod located to the left of your webinar platform. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's first presenter, AHA moderator, Drew Solo. Please go ahead. Welcome, everyone, to today's webinar. This is Drew Solo with American Hospital Association. I'm pleased to be moderating today's event, implementing a system-wide alarm alert and notification plan. This webinar is brought to you through the generous support of Philips. Please note you may submit a question for our presenters at any time using the Q&A pod to the left-hand side of the screen. Simply type your question in and hit submit. Our presenters will answer as many questions as possible at the end of the session. During this webinar, Advocate Aurora Health and Philips will discuss the components to consider when implementing a system-wide alarm management strategy in order to improve patient care and support patient safety by reducing non-actionable alarms, noise, and alarm fatigue. They will not only discuss how to establish a government governance structure in order to ensure alignment across organizations, but also how to share a current state assessment process, including their findings pertaining to the issue. Finally, they will cover a pilot implementation plan along with the outcomes and impact of the recent program. Let me briefly introduce today's speakers. Melinda Jamil is the Human Factors Manager at Advocate Aurora Health. In this role, she works with clinical engineers, patient safety managers, simulation specialists, and clinical team members to investigate potential system issues and identify improvements. Outcomes include redesigning technology, environments, and processes to improve patient and team members' safety, effectiveness, and well-being. Melinda's ultimate goal is to redesign the work to fit the human instead of the other way around. Our other presenter today is Lisa Paul, and she is the Principal and Practice Operations Lead at Philips Healthcare Transformation Services. Lisa is a recognized expert in alarm fatigue and alarm management. She's a member of the AAMI, Healthcare Technology Safety Institute's National Clinical Alarm Steering Committee, and often presents on alarm management. Her clinical expertise spans adult critical care, NICU and PICU, telemetry, ED and OR, along with past nursing positions spanning multiple healthcare sectors. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Melinda, who will begin our presentation. All right, thank you so much, Drew, and thank you to everybody who has tuned in for this lunch hour today. I'm excited to share some work with you that Lisa's and my team have done together over the past few years. Um, first, just to give you a little uh, brief background about Advocate Aurora Health, um, we are one of the 10th largest not-for-profit health systems. We have a, a number of hospitals that span from uh, Illinois, especially around Chicagoland and up through Wisconsin. Um, so we, we have 500 locations um, and 70,000 team members. And so I've been with the team at Advocate Aurora Health for about a year and a half now, and I've had the fortune to work on many interesting and meaningful projects, some of which we will be discussing with you today. And as Drew mentioned, I am a human factors engineer, and so I, I venture a guess that probably some people on in our meeting today haven't heard of human factors. Um, so just as a very quick overview, um, I'm, I'm going to talk about what this is because it really relates to the work that we will be presenting to you today. So human factors has really been an established field since about World War II. And like Drew mentioned in my uh, bio, the tagline that I like to use is we don't redesign the human to fit the work, we redesign the work to fit the human. So we use um, a lot of information from psychology and, uh, and, and scientific uh, results to understand human behavior and capabilities to then redesign the technology or the environment or the processes that we're doing in order to increase our safety and our effectiveness and well-being. So the initiatives that we will discuss today really fit with this, examining how to improve our use of healthcare technology to better support our humans. All right, so to start, what is the challenge that we wanted to address? Before we get into that, I have a pop quiz for you. So this is just a little fun poll. Um, you can click your answers on the screen. The question is, what percentage of monitoring alarms are identified as non-actionable? And if you're not exactly sure of the definition of non-actionable, don't worry. Uh, Lisa is going to go into detail about that a little bit later.
All right, we'll give you a few more seconds. It looks like our answers are firming up on the screen here. And so I'm going to go ahead and end the poll now. And I'm not sure, if, Lisa, are you able to see the results on the screen? Let's see. I don't know if the, if the team watching this webinar can see. Yep, so you're able to see the, the top answer is that people chose was 75% to 85%. That's a pretty big number of alarms that, that would be non-actionable. So moving on to my next slide, however, the answer is actually 85 to 99% of alarms are non-actionable. Um, so that is sort of, you know, that's a huge statistic. And this comes from the Joint Commission. Um, and also from uh, the Joint Commission, there have been patient deaths that have occurred due to missed alarms. So this is common knowledge or research that's been published out there. Um, these statistics are not from our hospital specifically, our hospitals, but um, it, within our organization, we have certainly had many concerns that alarms seem to go off all the time. And I have a feeling that a number of the folks in our meeting today um, have that same concern. So we started trying to think about how or, or back when our research was, uh, or when our studies and pilots started, we wanted to figure out how to reduce these. Um, for some hospitals, the goal for projects like the ones that we will talk about are to meet the Joint Commission Patient Safety Goal on Clinical Alarms, and our driving motiv motivation has been patient safety. Um, another driver for us is standardization. So we want to look at this from a system perspective. Rather than for um, an individual hospital or department, we want to move to the, a system-wide strategy where we can look across to see what similarities and differences there are and how that we can mediate this. And then finally, um, data analysis. So we had some frustration that we weren't able to get our own alarm data to see um, which alarms are the ones that, that are going off most often in what departments um, and which ones we should really start to address. So again, kind of relate, relating this back to human factors, we're not looking at who is making these errors and that they need to improve, but looking at why do we as humans make these errors and what can we do about it. So uh, the ECRI Top 10 Technology Hazards list comes out every year, and alarms has been on there in one shape or form for the last uh, seven to 10 years. So we recognize this need. And we're not just looking at monitoring alarms, but there are also a number of other sources for alarms, such as nurse call, IV pumps. And there are a lot of factors involved, like who is responsible for responding to those alarms. And we also know that alarms are, uh, have an impact on our patients. They're a major source of hospital noise. So you can see on the left one of the, the um, HCAP scores, which says, during this hospital stay, how often was the area around your room quiet at night? And the results, this is for, from uh, Hospital Compare, the national average response is 62%. So that's one of the lowest rated satisfaction survey responses. You can see on the right some of the other uh, sources for the noise besides the alarms. Alarms is definitely um, one of the major ones, but some of the others include other patients. Um, one study found that there were up to 86 different sources of noise in the hospital environment. So, but as I mentioned, alarms are still a very significant contributor. We also know that noise impacts um, staff as well, both patients and staff. So excessive ambient noise in hospitals adversely affects patient sleep and recovery, and then also affects uh, stress, fatigue, and staff and hampers communication. So uh, all of this together um, shows the negative impact of noise on patients as well as our team members, which can also contribute to stress and burnout. So with all of these effects of noise, it's clear that we need to have a concerted effort to work hard towards a solution. Um, so we formed an alarm management steering committee 
with multidisciplinary system leaders at AAH, and then partnered with Philips to conduct this work. <coughs> Excuse me. So our project goal was to identify opportunities to reduce non-actionable alarms and unnecessary noise, while also standardizing our alarm management processes. Um, ultimately, this is to improve patient care as well as our staff satisfaction and empower our team members to address alarms. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Lisa. Thank you, Melinda, and hello, everyone. Right now, we're going to talk a little bit about how we understood what was going on at Advocate Aurora Health in terms of our current state assessment. And what you see on here is really everything we look at when we're doing an assessment. We are using data as our foundation. It really gives us some baseline information and can help us understand where uh, there might be some opportunities. For this particular one, we were looking at monitoring alarm data, but also Rowland nurse call data and Alaris IV pumps. We did this at three of the Advocate Aurora Healthcare sites, and we were really looking at critical care, telemetry, and the ED. Those were our focus areas. So we started with the data, but then we were really looking at people, process, technology, and culture. We really want to understand why people do the things they do. Do they really follow policies that are in place? If not, why not? What are the barriers? So we observe frontline staff. We talk to them uh, to try and engage them. We also do formal interviews with leadership. And we really then look at that end-to-end -end monitoring and alarm management process. From a technology perspective, we're just trying to figure out what do people understand and use in their existing technology? And are they aware of capabilities that might currently exist to help them in terms of patient care rather than waiting for alarms or alerts to go off? And then really looking at culture from a unit perspective, a hospital perspective, and a system. And for us, it's what happens if there is a patient event? Does staff feel safe coming forward with it? What's the philosophy in terms of onboarding? Do we recognize as an organization that technology and alarm management is important? And really, who are the deciders? Is it a physician-driven culture, a nurse-driven culture, or a mix of both? Because that'll impact some of the things you want to focus on in terms of opportunities. So we did talk about reducing non-actionable alarms. So what does that mean? Uh, I can say there are various views on this. So what you're seeing on here is some of uh, the more frequent ones that are talked about. But what we tell every place is this is a decision you really need to make as you start on this journey because it will be dependent on your patient populations, your treatment modalities, your staffing models, your care delivery models. But typically, an actionable alarm is something that requires some sort of an action or intervention. It can be clinical in nature, but it can also be technology related, meaning you need to do something in order for the technology to get the information it needs from the patient. So usually everybody agrees life-threatening alarms require an immediate response and are actionable, something that is truly alerting us to a change in patient status, or like I was talking about, something related to the technology. Maybe ECG leads off so we really can't get a signal. In terms of non-actionable alarms, those typically are Short duration self-correcting. That SpO2 dips down below the limit. You get an alarm, but it immediately comes back up. Or we're doing things. We know alarm's going to go off. Suctioning is one that tends to trigger alarms. Or we take the patient off because they're getting a bath. <coughs> Excuse me. The other thing is due to tight limits. So they're not really customized or appropriate for the patient. And then false alarms. For whatever reason, the system just isn't analyzing things correctly. So we do have one other poll question, curious about this one. We're talking about alarms, but also alerts and notifications. So at your facility, are you aware, is anybody really looking at the big picture in terms of alarms and alerts that staff receive? So your options are yes, no, and not sure. And we can see responses are filling up on this. And for this one, there isn't a right or wrong answer. It is really just trying to understand where facilities are at as they're looking at this process. But as Melinda mentioned earlier, this is really the first year that ECRI has focused on looking at all of these rather than just alarms from a particular system. So I, I think in terms of the vote, uh, we can see uh, 
majority say no. Uh, the next is not sure. And about a quarter of the respondents say yes, that they're doing something. So it's good to know some places are started on this. And for some others, uh, there are opportunities there. So in terms of data, what do we do? We are trying to take data from multiple systems, compile it, and also make it what we call user-friendly. Unfortunately, most data right now that comes out of healthcare systems is not user-friendly. It can be lines uh, on an Excel spreadsheet. And it can be things that just don't make sense. So we really were looking at the monitoring alarm data. We were looking at, I say it from big picture down to small. So what are total alarms across the organization and then really across units and how do units compare? We want to know total alarms on units and in the site to really understand the overall noise and disruptions that occur. But we also want to know what are the total alarms per patient bed per day. That's a benchmark out there when you're looking at studies that have been done. Because I would typically expect a 20-bed ICU to have more alarms than a 10-bed. So the alarms per bed per day really looks at that. We got data from the Rowland system. We did sound measurements. We got data from the IV Alaris system as well. And really drilled down again on individual alarms that occurred to try and get a good baseline. We did also talk to staff informally on the unit as part of our observations. And what you see on here are some of those comments we got from staff as we were talking to them about really managing alarms and alerts, some of the challenges, some of the frustrations. Uh, not surprising, some say they hate all the beeping. Uh, for some, it's protocols that they fear or feel are too rigid, uh, one sleep apnea. And for that one, putting a lot of people on SPO2 monitoring, causing alarms to go off as well. So a uh, lot of uh, feedback in terms of dissatisfaction and frustration and wanting to improve things. In addition, we talked about interviews. I just want to say we do formal interviews with leadership, too, to try and see is our leadership and frontline staff on the same page. We did the workflows, again, that end-to-end -end monitoring and alarm management process. We look at default settings and configurations and all of the technology devices we're assessing. We look at policies, protocols that are currently in place. Are they easy to follow? Are staff adhering to them? And we do surveys. So it's a quick survey, about two to three minutes at the beginning to, again, understand better where staff feel they are and some of the challenges are. Um, and again, just looking and observing when alarms go off, what does staff do? The other thing in all of the sites we did that had tele, we were looking at tele, they all had central monitoring units. So that was the other piece we were looking at is that interaction between the central monitoring unit and the monitor techs and the floor staff related to telemetry monitoring and alarms. And when we try and implement best practices, part of the challenge is, in particular for monitor techs, there really aren't clear guidelines as far as how many sectors a monitor tech can actually watch. There is one research study that's out there that Duke did, and they did a simulation to see what would happen as the number of sectors go up and the ability of the staff to actually catch a life-threatening alarm. And you can see on the graph to the left that as the sectors go up, that it does take longer for them to recognize that life-threatening alarm. On the right, you can see their day-to-day -day tasks and activities monitor techs have to do, and that as the number of sectors go up, they're responsible for their effectiveness at getting those tasks done also decreases. I think there's one other study that's in the works that's coming out, but again, there's not a clear, here's how many sectors other than if you look at this one, and again, no, as they start to go up, that time does take longer. So that was one of the things we did as well. We were looking at the monitor text, how many sectors they had, but we're also looking at alarm load because some places will sometimes just assign, here you have this unit, you have this unit, and that really look at is a particular unit a more acute patient population that we anticipate is going to have more alarms. Some places also have monitor techs watch EDs or ICUs, which can have more alarms as well. So we want to understand that, too, and try and figure out if there might be a better way to balance it. So that's another assessment we do. We talked about alerts. And so we also want to understand, when we have alarms going off, who gets notified either 
or an automated system, or maybe it's a phone call from the monitor tech. So I'm looking at the Rollin nurse call system. This is just a sample that uh, one of the units. You can see really every first alert that came from the Rollin nurse call system was sent to a PCA. Uh, organizations might call it a PCT or a nursing assistant. But they got all of these. In addition, they got the first phone call from the monitor tech if there was a leads off alarm or a need to replace the battery in the tele device. So really in talking to them, they were overloaded. And that's what we heard. It, it was the, all I can do is either try and respond to the notifications I get or I can try and take care of patients. So it's really trying to balance safety with capabilities. On some of these, you'll see they had 30 seconds before it would actually escalate to the next level. And trying to figure out, is that really enough time? But also, who needs to get the alert when? So now I am going to hand it back over to Melinda to talk a little bit more about telemetry. Thank you. So Lisa was talking about um, the number of sectors that a monitor tech can watch. And um, a lot of their research into alerts and alarms had to do with uh, telemetry monitoring. And they were finding a lot of opportunities there. Simultaneously, we had within AAH another team that uh, started to look at this issue as well. And so we pulled together um, some uh, stakeholders across many of our hospitals to strategically determine an approach to how to improve the safety of our telemetry patients. And so this is just talking about um, that we've been doing that work simultaneously. And then we are also um, working with Philips to um, collaborate and, and support those efforts um, with additional data and additional structure and, and projects. So uh, what we decided then is for a lot of the Philips pilots that we will be talking about today, they focus more on our critical care units and step down and um, emergency departments. And then we are also collecting data from our telemetry unit. Um, this slide is, is one slide that encapsulates a lot of years of work kind of summarized here. So um, this just shows the types of activities that we've done with our telemetry process improvement team. Uh, and so you can see that there have been multiple full day events with frontline staff members, including monitor techs and nurses, um, along with leaders who can um, implement some changes that we see as necessary. Um, and so we've had several of these workshop events We've implemented some changes. We have, um, as the human factors engineer, I've gone to each of our sites to observe workflows and help design work solutions, standard work solutions, to address some of the gaps that we have. Um, we've spent five days with uh, representatives across the, all of our 27 hospitals coming together to create those new processes. And then now we're going through some change management, including issuing um, CAPAs and audits to kind of track our progress. So kind of simultaneously with the projects that we're talking about today, we've been doing a lot of work related to um, telemetry and monitoring. So now we're going to take a look at uh, sampling of some of the results. Um, some had stronger impact. So some of them will show some really big results and sometimes not. And so it's important to examine the data and figure out why. And so we are also going back and determining whether it's possible to maintain some of the changes that we saw during the time that Philips implemented our pilot projects. Um, so let's see. On the next slide, this is an all-encompassing list of the projects that the Philips teams implemented. You can see that we are at three different hospitals called A, B, and C here. But within each of those hospitals, um, we had team members from different departments who came together to do workshops and then co-create um, to really drill down and look at some of the initial data that Philips had gathered through their interviews and on-site assessments and alarm assessments to figure out what some of the parameters would be or, or priorities would be to address. And so each site had a Philips project lead and each area um, had a, an AAH project lead. And they together set up um, a timeline and participants. They determined they created a very um, detailed charter. So there was, it was a very structured process. Determined what education would be needed to roll out pilot changes, um, if there were any special approvals that were needed for those changes, and then how to communicate. Um, and so Philips uh, 
then would bring in team members that were on site at the hospital the first week that any changes were implemented. You can see sort of uh, across what some of those projects related to. So there was alarm configuration or customization in the ICU, um, updating the alarm default. Uh, there were some that did address ECG leads off alarm specifically and had to do with telemetry units. Um, we addressed Rollins nurse call settings. And then on the right, you can see that at two of our hospitals, we did uh, a pilot telemetry default parameters. And so we'll talk a little bit about the results from some of these. Now this side just is saying that, hey, there are some things that are already out there. So Christiana Care uh, did some work about 10 years ago, and they, so they were at the forefront looking at default settings and the, and the changes that um, can make a difference in, in non-actionable alarms. And then others started following at that point. So Advocate Aurora Health had already um, done some of this. We had some alarms defaulted off based on these best practice guidelines. And while this helped, it did not solve all of the potential problems. So now Lisa will talk about some of the results. Yep, sorry, thank you, Melinda. Yeah, and we have one result on here uh, that you can see, and this was one of the pilots we did related to customization. And so we will talk about some default settings changes, but this one was really trying to get staff to look at the patients and figure out what made sense for this particular patient as far as where their default settings should be. And there were select things that we looked at, so it really wasn't, gee, here's the customization process you can use for every alarm uh, that is connected to this patient or that there may be settings related to. It was really deciding their specific ones that we're going to look at, and all told it was about six. With things like uh, non-invasive blood pressure, invasive blood pressure, SpO2, heart rate. And so overall, uh, we had about a quarter reduction. So I would say that was pretty good. We will talk a little bit later about some of the challenges that you run into with customization. And before we go any further, I did want to say, because we did talk about governance structure, and I know Melinda has talked about the teleprocess improvement team. For our particular project as we were doing it, even though we're communication because Melinda is on both, uh, and so it's kind of the go-between. We did also have a steering committee at Advocate Aurora Health that was composed, it was multidisciplinary of nurses, providers, clinical engineering, Melinda, who's human factors, IT, as well as Phillips. So really trying to pull in as many people as we could as we were making decisions and making changes and deciding on direction to go. Here is where you see specifically related to default settings. So in this case, we configured things differently in the device so that as soon as it's turned on, what pops up as a default setting is in place. So at one hospital, Hospital B, the two things we looked at were SpO2 and the PVC rate. And at the other hospital, Hospital C, we looked at SpO2, but in this case, non-sustained VTAC. In terms of the SpO2, both places were set originally at 90 as the low limit and a 10 second delay. So they'd have to drop below that for 10 seconds. There's a lot of literature out there and a lot of places now have done 88 seconds and saying you can go down to there safely. And a lot of places are extending that to 15 seconds. Some places have even gone to 20 depending on the unit. And you can see in Hospital B, we have pretty good results again, about 29% reduction. Not the case in Hospital C, only about a 1% reduction. And it is looking, again, at patient populations. Is the staff already customizing? How often are they doing SPO2 monitoring? So that's the factor. For the PVC rate, we changed it from 10, triggering an alarm in a minute, to 30. And again, you can see pretty significant results, 76% reduction. The other one was really an on-off. So instead of having that non-sustained VTAC alarm defaulted on, we changed it to off. So again, it, you're going to expect to see almost 100% reduction in that. For all of these, the staff, though, could make changes if they wanted to. So if they wanted to back it up to 90 for a particular patient for SpO2 or turn on sustained VTAC on because the patient needed it, they could do that. 
The other thing we did was related to the Alaris IV pumps, and there was another initiative going on at Advocate Aurora Health where they really were working with the Alaris vendor to identify standards across the organization because places did have some different settings in there. And so they were interested in one in particular because there was some variation in that. And so that was the one we decided to pilot, and it was related to patient side partial occlusion alarms. And you can see by making changes on that, how many uh, seconds and how long it took to trigger that, there was a 29% reduction. And so this is underway, again, across the system to standardize. The other thing we looked at was the Rowland nurse call. And for the Rowland nurse call, we did show you where those initial alerts were going, which was to the PCT, which you can see on here. So if it was a toilet, if it was somebody uh, wanted water, or if they just wanted somebody to come in, that initial alert when it was triggered went to the primary PCT, but it also went to all three of the Rowland Nurse Call phones at each nursing station, regardless of where the patient was. So you had those things going off, and then after a two-minute delay, it would go to the primary RN, and after another two-minute delay, it would go after or out to the charge nurse and then repeat the process. So what we did was say, do we really need to have it going off at the desk initially at the phone? And does it have to go off at all three phones at each nursing station? And so the decision was made to say, no, when the alert first goes off, we'll send it to the primary PCT, but we'll wait after that two minute delay if it's not responded to, we will send it to the primary RN, but we'll also send it to the primary PCT and then have it go only to the phone where that nurse is, or that patient is located. And two minutes go by again, now we escalate to the charge nurse and to all the phones at all the nurses stations. And for that one, their HCAP scores improvement, and these came from a, a hospital where we did the pilot, and you can see that the uh, time to respond uh, for the call lights uh, was a uh, high improvement. Uh, it was an improvement. It took less time, let's put it that way. That's what that means. And the same thing for the toilet. Uh, so they were getting faster responses. Also, we reduced them based on those sounds going across the unit up to almost 8,000 audible alerts going to those consoles on each nursing station. So pretty significant impact in terms of sound and disruption going on in the unit. The other thing we did it really tied to the tele performance improvement uh, project was looking at the default settings for telemetry. And so we did a pilot on this. And you can see on here really good results on all the changes. One was related to the heart rate. And again, changing that default from 120 to 140. The low heart rate from 50 to 40 that SpO2 for the tele patients down to 88 as well, and then changing the PVC rate for the tele patients from 10 to 20. So again, results ranging anywhere from a 56% reduction to an 87% reduction also. So good results on that. And now I'm going to pass it back to Melinda, who's going to talk a little bit about some that we had hoped were going to be a little bit better. Yeah, so we had we had identified with Philip's help that ECGs leave off alarms were one of the prevalent ones across many different departments. So that was something that we wanted to try to address and, and test out potential um, changes that might improve these rates of leave off alarms. Um, we you can see three different boxes here that represent three different departments that um, did these pilots. So in the ED, uh, we had team members trying to decrease those low priority alarms by using a standby function of the monitoring. For the ICU, uh, they were going to educate and try and use more standby and pause of alarms. And finally, in a tele department, um, we implemented a new uh, electrode placement work, uh, standard work and skin prep, and changing of electrodes every 24 hours. So you can see that across the bottom, um, we didn't have any change at the ED. We did have a 15% reduction at the ICU and also a 14% reduction at tele. But those leave off alarms are still at a very high number. They are one of the, the higher incidence of alarms that we have. Um, so <clears throat> um, a big difference between these pilots and some of the previous 
that all of these require workflow and practice changes. So this wasn't about um, changing settings or changing the routing of alarms. Um, it required changes of day-to-day -day changes for our nursing staff and for our, um, our nurse techs. And for those workflow changes, um, it, there's uh, many different factors in play. And so, you know, we've been considering having on-site peer resources, um, using audits, and it really it is sort of a change um, management and organizational and culture um, factors that, that would be needed in order to have those changes adopted. Um, some very good news is that we were tracking whether there were any safety events that occurred during these changes because you've seen, you know, we've been changing high heart rate or a number of different monitor um, settings. Um, we've been changing practice and we had zero um, patient uh, safety events entered into our um, reporting system as well as reported by the departments who were involved in the pilot. So that's something that we wanted to watch closely as we're, we're making these changes because all of, the point of all this was to um, test out the changes during a very controlled pilot to see what impact they might have. We have many different lessons learned, um, just three of them listed here. So how many alarms is considered good? Uh, we would get sometimes our data back that showed um, you know, the number of the thousands of alarms that occur on a daily basis. There really is no gold standard. Um, it does depend on what's going on with the patient and what's going on in the department. So uh, by doing a pilot like this, we're able to look at those baseline measurements and then to see if there is improvement. Um, we certainly uh, relied quite a bit on Phillips' expertise and, um, and, and boots on the ground to help to determine, first of all, what changes were possible. Um, if we had tried to look at those results and try uh, look at our data reports, as Lisa showed earlier, some of it we wouldn't have been able to interpret. We also wouldn't have known what can be changed without leading, reading through some long IFUs and um, trying to understand what's possible. And then finally, um, default setting changes, like we mentioned earlier, are, are sort of the low-hanging fruit, but really it's just a starting point. So it does result in some reduction in alarm, but there is so much work that we can do. Some of the results um, indicated that customization is difficult to implement. So um, you can see in the graph here, across the four weeks of one of our pilots, uh, we had the highest reduction in alarms during week number one. And you can see with a star that that's when we had Philip on-site support. And sometimes I was rounding at those hospitals as well. So the team members are fully aware of, of what this changes. There's additional education going on. There are reminders in, in for example, making, uh, customizing the alarms for their patients. As the weeks go on, the number of alarms um, diminishes unless there are other types of reinforcement that can help with that adoption. Um, and also in other types of um, work changes that can make it a little bit more automated that don't require so much on manual work or memory of the team members. And as we talked about before, data can be difficult. So with the help of Phillips, we found ways to um, look at and create reports uh, and there are ways that, that um, teams have built different dashboards, especially if you have um, units that you are tracking many changes for over a period of time. This is something that's possible but requires a lot of extra work, so it can be difficult. And some of our next steps, um, one of them is a regional central tele unit. Uh, so uh, we've talked about several of our projects and results, and, and so this uh, future regional tele-unit was, decision was made as some of our sites do not currently have central tele-monitoring. <clears throat> and so by going to this model of centralizing, um, this really drives the need to standardize and to try to determine what the best settings are and best practices so that we can um, implement those at the beginning. Uh, we need to be able to use our resources effectively and communicate effectively as well. Um, you can see a picture here of sort of a central monitoring. This isn't a rendering of what our, um, our, our central tally unit is going to look like, but Phillips has a design team that works with us 
to determine what our space needs are, our configuration, and, and technology for that central toilet unit. And as Lisa mentioned before, I just wanted to say some additional next steps. The big one is our alarm management team. So uh, we do have this group of um, multidisciplinary folks that are looking at the work that's been completed by Phillips and by our local teams and is determining how to roll this out across our hospitals and how to sustain it. So an alarm management committee is key. Okay, and back over to you, Lisa. Thanks, Melinda. So we're getting near the end, and we've talked about a lot of different things in terms of impact on patients and staff, and really, again, a driver is patient safety, and that can be from missing an alarm to staff being distracted by all the alerts and notifications that are going off, which then also impacts the patient and staff experience. And so when we talk, again, about really combining and looking at things, for us, we were able to look at the number of monitoring alarms that occurred in a unit, as well as the number of Rowell and nurse call alerts that occurred over a month. And you can see the totals there. And then we did what I call a little bit of fuzzy math, but it's still pretty impactful. But if you total those together and then divide it up over time from a 30-day period, it really comes to over one disruption per minute that patients are hearing, staff are expected to respond to. If you multiply that out, so again, a little bit of the fuzzy, fuzzy math, but do that over a year, that's over half a million alarms and alerts per year on one unit. And that's not taking into account if they have uh, ventilators, if there are phones going off, if there are other alarming devices. And so now multiply that across all the units in the hospital as well, and you can see that the impact it has. So, we talk about patient safety and then patient experience. And this quote is pretty old. It's back from the 1970s, but I really like it because it gets us to think a little bit differently. And it's really the sense of hearing can't be closed off at will. Uh, we don't have ear lids like we have eyelids. When we go to sleep at night, our perception of sound is the last door to be closed. And it's also the first to open when we awaken. And Hopefully for most of our patients, we can change it so the last thing they're not hearing is an alarm or an alert and the same thing when they wake up and that we can improve their overall experience within the organization, the hospital that they're in. And that's it as far as our presentation. And now I want to thank you all for your time and we have time for questions. And I am going to hand it back to Drew for that. Great. Thank you, Melinda and Lisa, for your presentation. We will now begin the question and answer portion of today's event. Please note the webinar session will be available on demand after today's event, and all attendees will receive a follow-up. As a reminder for the Q&A session, you may submit a question for our speakers in the question and answer box to the left of the presentation. Simply type your question in the box and hit submit. Our speakers will answer as many questions as possible in the time remaining. Questions that are unable to be answered in our allotted time will be shared with the speakers for follow-up offline. So the first question I have, Melinda, I think is, is best for you, and that is, um, what was the impact of staffing as you put your, the system into place, and did your system have to add more RN nurses or text to your FTEs? Okay, so the question is, um, as we put the system into place, let me see. Um, for these piloting, no, we did not add more nurses or text um, for this, if, if that's what the question is relating to. Um, so for the piloting and for making the changes or such as customization, we still worked with our, our current team members. Um, we will and are looking at staffing models, of course, as they move to a regional central telemetry unit. So that is certainly something that impacts staffing um, and what those roles are because a lot of those workflows will be changing. OK, great. Our next question for Lisa. Lisa, what is the best way to deal with alarm fatigue even after alarms have been individualized? So it's really starting at the beginning. Anytime you get technology, trying to look at which alarms do we actually need on it. Uh, so even for things like IV pumps, you really need to have an alarm going off to let you know that your IV piggyback is empty. So 
looking, again, do you have to have particular alarms on or not? The other thing is looking at whether the patient needs to continue to be monitored for something. We tend to talk about telemetry a lot, and there are guidelines on there about are out there as far as who should be on telemetry, who has the clinical need, when you typically can take them off. So when we leave them on longer, uh, we tend to generate more alarms that we're not necessarily doing anything about. But it's even the same thing in critical care. We tend to monitor different parameters and don't really look at those critically every day to say, does this particular patient still need this or not? Uh, and if they don't need it, then to take it off because, again, otherwise it just generates alarms. And things like CVPs, we have places going, even if we're using it, do we really need to have an alarm for that or not? So it's really looking at the big picture. Uh, and again, who's getting the alert and where they're going? Do they have to go to everybody? Can you whittle that down? And do you have to send all the alerts out too? Great, thank you. Um, Melinda, another question for you. Have you implemented order sets or other electronic methods to reduce unnecessary use of cardiac monitoring? Yes, and so that is something that is ongoing work that the telemetry process improvement team um, has been addressing. We have a subcommittee that is working um, with our HIT and our informatics teams um, to develop that new order set. So we did just go through a change, um, and I think it should be noted that um, the digital system itself, the EHR, doesn't necessarily um, it can't solve everything, kind of just like setting the parameters doesn't solve everything. So we have an ongoing process with a team um, that is working with, in particular, um, our emergency department champions to, to look at what the practice is for ordering telemetry. Um, and, and again, it's one of those multifaceted um, uh, challenges where it's going to take a lot of changes in terms of organization and culture as well as the EHR. Great, thank you. Uh, Lisa, another question for you. What healthcare providers have authority and responsibility to adjust, uh, adjust and customize alarms, and how have you responded to TJC um, when surveyed? So this is another one of those that there really is no standard answer to, and I alluded to it earlier as to why we look at culture, and part of culture being who are the deciders in your organization. I can tell you we've been places that are very nurse-driven, and as a result, that decision is really allotted to the nursing staff. We've been other places where it's very physician-driven, and nurses do not make that decision. They solely rely on the physicians and providers to do that. In terms of the Joint Commission, I, I can say the sites we've worked with, in terms of who's doing it, hasn't come up, but what's coming up is how are you doing it, and uh, how are you deciding as an organization who's doing it? One of the feedback we did here at one site from the Joint Commission is if you are doing it for nurses so that they can use their critical thinking skills and their assessment skills, they still need some sort of a guideline. So it could be plus or minus 10%. It could be something like implementing a buddy system that I go get uh, Melinda, if she were a nurse, to say, hey, I'm Mrs. Jones, I'm thinking about changing this limit, and here's why, and getting Melinda to agree that, yes, my judgment is correct on this. Um, for others, it's giving those guidelines that if you go above, again, a certain percentage, or if there are certain values you're changing, you do need to get a provider order. And the goal there is to really ensure that nurse provider conversation are occurring because that is really what we want to make sure. Now, it also means providers could set different notifications that they want to be contacted with. So as a nurse, I may be setting my heart rate at one area because I'm concerned about my patient having pain and their heart rate going up, uh, or they've been running a fever, and again, I want to catch it earlier, where the provider is more concerned because they're trying to adjust uh, cardiac medication or blood pressure medication, so it might change. So that's why I said it's not an easy process. If you make it too complex, nobody will follow it. <clears throat> and if you make it too simple, it won't have an impact. It's more understanding if your nurses feel safe with whatever guidelines you've given them to make those changes. So sorry, a little bit of a long answer, uh, but no, it I, really I, is a, a complex uh, problem to try and solve. Great. Um, and Lisa, another question for you. 
When staff are customizing the alarms per patient assessment, how is this documented so that it doesn't look like alarms are just arbitrarily being changed to decrease the number of alarms nurses are having to respond to? I can tell you for the pilot that we did, the decision was made, again, with a project lead on site and input from the nursing staff that one of the things they were going to do was they were going to document it on the Phillips Central Station. There's a notes piece there, and so they were supposed to document on there the customization done and at what time. And so from an audit perspective, they were able to go back and look. Have they documented this? Have they done it? Long term, there are places where they look at it and say, yes, we actually want it to be part of the documentation system so that the staff is acknowledging that they've at least looked. They may not customize, they may leave what it is, but if they've customized that they are saying and uh, what they've changed. So it varies uh, across sites. Uh, we have not been to a place where the Joint Commission has asked for that. Uh, again, I know that can vary as well, uh, and there are some places who don't document it anywhere. Uh, it is just they document and they have in a protocol or a policy what the guidelines are and what the nurses can do, and they just reference that that's what they adhere to. Great. Um, Linda, I have a question for you. Uh, one of the challenges referenced was a difference of opinion about who, meaning, you know, a nurse versus provider and who should be making decisions about alarm customization. The issue came up with their um, Joint Commission mock surveyors. What are you doing to address this concern? Yeah, I think, Lisa, is that one that you have some insights for? Sorry. Uh, yes, I, I think, again, it's one we were really just talking about. Um, and I always would like more information as far as, okay, what do they say in terms of uh, the mock survey? And I always say every surveyor can be a little bit different. I have not seen anything consistent, that's what I'm saying, from the Joint Commission other than they want some sort of identified process, not just saying, oh, yes, the nurses can customize alarms. Um, the debate I usually see is not from the Joint Commission. It really is sites who tend to have a view, leadership does, uh, that yes, it should be the physicians driving this and other sites, no, it should be nurses. Ultimately, in my view, it should be a collaboration uh, for critical care. In particular, it would be good to incorporate it into rounds so that it's something that's being addressed, again, from a multidisciplinary perspective. Um, but it's really finding what fits for your organization, what makes the most sense, what will people actually do and uh, how does it fit with your patient population? Great. And kind of a similar, similar question. Um, have you faced Joint Commission issues or any of your, your clients with customization in particular? Yes, and I think we uh, talked about that uh, really what they want to see is some sort of a protocol. Uh, so like I mentioned earlier, either the plus 10%, minus 10%, uh, 20 above, 20 below, whatever it may be, which things can be changed. Uh, so again, can you gotcha. customize everything? Or are there things you should not be customizing? And when it gets to a certain point, then yes, you want to be having that conversation with your provider. Great. Um, another question, for the actual counting of the alarms, was that a Philips program, or were there other special software utilized in that process? So yeah, this is Melinda. Um, oh, probably go ahead, Lisa Melinda, can sorry. give more. Yeah, Lisa will be able to give more detail about that, but we did use the, the Philips software. We have um, some hospitals within our system that use other monitoring systems, and so, yes, it really is something that it has to be done through the, um, the manufacturer, through the vendor, to, to get access to that data, um, and then there are various ways uh, that you could potentially work with it. So the vendor might have additional tools for analyzing as well as um, trending over time, um, or we've created some of our own as well within, within our system. Great. And um, another question for you, Melinda, um, as you may have advice here, how, how does one start this process um, and, and kind of organizing an alarm committee to get things moving? Yeah. 
Yeah, I think um, we've been fortunate to work with, or I have at Advocate Aurora Health, with a number of um, team members that are very patient safety focused. And so I believe, you know, some of this, these initiatives came from our patient safety team as well as our clinical engineering, our um, healthcare technology management team. Um, in, in, in working with Philips and getting advice as well on, on other organizations that, that have done something similar. So I think um, it was a combination of a few different uh, system level team, team members and leaders who saw this as an issue and an opportunity and then began pulling together um, members of that committee. And so I think Lisa was mentioning earlier, we do have um, HIT on that team. We have clinical engineering and um, majority, we have nurse leaders and, and frontline nursing staff as well as, um, I'm sure I'm forgetting others too, but uh, monitor techs as, as well. So and we have a number of team members who come in ad hoc. So we have a set a, a, a consistent uh, meeting time that, that happens uh, bi-monthly and then for the last few months, we've been working and looking at the results of these pilots in particular. But going forward, that team is responsible for taking all of these results and figuring out what to, uh, and how to implement them across our system. Great. I think we have time for one more question. Um, the question is, we currently monitor respirations on all of our medical surgical patients due to multiple variables that exist to get a good pattern, um, you know, placement of electrodes, movement, et cetera. But our yellow alarms are constantly going off. Um, are there any guidelines to monitoring respirations versus using an uh, SpO2 on everyone? And that's a great question. And this gets down to what's the right monitor for the patient at the right place at the right time? Uh, we talked about telemetry. And so I'm not sure if you're doing the respiratory rate in conjunction with telemetry. Uh, if you are, I would encourage looking at early warning scoring systems instead. Uh, respiratory rate is a huge factor on that. But those systems often have wearable devices that are a little bit different than using the electrodes to get respiratory rate. And they look at other factors, too, to give you that score that there's potential deterioration going on uh, much more effectively than tele if tele isn't required for a clinical reason. In terms of the SpO2, really what's being looked at now is uh, CO2. And does CO2 make more sense, again, for the majority of patient populations rather than SpO2? So that would be something else I would say probably look at to see for those particular patient populations uh, if it makes more sense or not for them. If they're getting uh, PCA, for instance, uh, sleep apnea can be another one, uh, things like that. Great. Right. That concludes the time we have available for questions. In the next few days, all attendees will receive an email that will include a link to the archive webinar session. Thank you to our audience for joining us, and thank you, Melinda Jamil and Linda Paul, for your presentation. Thank you to our sponsor, Phillips. Thanks again for joining. This concludes today's program. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's presentation. You may now disconnect.